Uh, with luck, you won't know uh, until I'm, I'm done, pretty much. Um, I had uh, a PowerPoint. I thought that was the, the thing to do, but I, I will try to play the audio from it because it's kind of a, a special uh, audio. But um, anyway, so this poet uh, is a Montreal poet, um, one of the finest poets of his generation, um, a poet with guts, a poet who refused to accept the Canadian kind of... Uh, strictures and parameters of poetry. In fact, railed against many of the poets uh, of the time, railed against the modernists, railed against uh, romantic poets, and uh, some of the words he used are the following, and I've got to get used to reading Sober. And you can't do nearsightedness with laser surgery. Okay, so this poet writes in an introduction to one of his books, each poem that thumbs its nose at death is a fusion of accident and destiny. As such, it is a structure in which the bronze athletic Philistine has not, is not interested. In any event, he can live without it. For accidents, he has insurance policies. For destiny, his image of Napoleon, should he be a profound intellectual suburbanite. The assurances of dialectical material materialism, if he is a Marxist proletarian. Before these, the poet, unwilling to act as choir, choir boy or morale builder, must appear ailing, furtive, hysterical. One who bumps his forehead against a wall, then exclaims, look at the lovely bump I have. It's the shape, isn't the shape glorious? Aren't the colors extraordinarily beautiful? Okay. And uh, the poet often has been accused of misogyny, um, often uh, been accused of being bombastic, often been accused of, uh, you know, sort of an ego that was excessive. But in many ways, like there's parts of his biography that if you read, the, the, the Waiting for the Messiah, um, there are moments in there where a lot of his attitudes towards people, the world, and even women to a certain extent, given uh, an incident with his cousin, which is just horrific, really his first sexual experience, and, uh, you know, incidents with his mother and his father, um, and the sort of absence of his father in his life, his father died when he was uh, very young, kind of explain at least, don't necessarily justify, but they at least explain some of the attitudes uh, that really kind of uh, permeated his, his work. But to say that he was always writing about, uh, you know, the darkness of humanity is, I think, untrue, as this poem called Sacrament by the Water indicates. How shall I sing the accomplished waters whose teeming cells make green my hopes? How shall the sun at daybreak marry us, twirling these waters like a hoop? Gift of the waters that sing their eternal passion for the sky, your exact beauty in a wave of tumult drops an Eden about your thighs. Green is the singing, singing water, and green is every joyous leaf, white myrtles in your hand and in the other, the hairy apple bringing life. So, you know, to say that this poet is, uh, you know, obsessed only by the darkness, really the opposition is what he's uh, most obsessed with. Eros and Thanatos, I, I heard him read once uh, at uh, John Abbott College, and that, he kept bringing that up. He had this huge mandala, he had white hair sort of streaming, and uh, his shirt open, his short, stout man, and uh, Eros and Thanatos in kind of constant conflict. But he sort of sets a very high bar for how a poet has to uh, encounter uh, writing and the world. And it's not one that, you know, I'm necessarily approving of, but it's one that I think made him uh, a gutsy, uh, very different poet from what, you know, Canada typically produced. With only a few exceptions, Lawrence Rambeau, the modern poet, has been an empty windbag and a chatterer. No wonder anguished people turn from him in amusement, boredom, or pity. He has nothing to say worth listening to. One asks for bread and is given a plethora of sounds. The major poets are children lost in a painted forest, making as much noise as they can to attract attention. 
The lesser ones absentmindedly continue br bringing their posies into the swept courtyard, courtyards of Auschwitz and Belsen. All of them intent on proving to the world how sensitive they are, how perceptive, how erudite and archetype crammed. The truth is this. Instead of remembering they are prophets and the descendants of prophets, the poets have swapped roles with entertainers and culture peddlers. They have refused the crown of thorns. Because he is a prophet, the poet must take into himself all the moral diseases, all the anguish and terror of his age, so that from, the, from them he can forge the wisdom his tortured fellow men need to resist the forces dragging them down into the inhuman and bestial. And uh, to talk about that and his mother, um, who was, uh, you know, obviously because his, his father died when he was so young, I'm going to read a poem he wrote on his uh, mother's death. Kaina Lazarevich. When I saw my mother's head on the cold pillow, her white water falling hair in the cheeks hollows, I thought, quietly circling my grief, of how she had loved God but cursed extravagantly his creatures. For her final mouth was not water, but a curse, a small black hole, a black rent in the universe, which damned the green earth, stars and trees in its stillness, and the inescapable lousiness of growing old. And I record she was comfortless, vituperative, ignorant, glad, and much else besides. I believe she endlessly praised her black eyebrows, their thick weave, till plagiarizing death leaned down and took them for his mold. And spoiled a dignity I shall not again find. And the fury of her stubborn, limited mind. Now none will shake her amber beads and call God blind, or wear them upon a breast so radiantly. Oh, fierce she was, mean and unaccommodating. But I think now of the toss of her gold earrings, their proud carnal assertion, and her youngest, and her youngest sings while all the rivers of her red veins move into the sea. Lastly, you know, this poet had many uh, awards, Governor General's Award, one of the few Canadian writers to have ever been no nominated for the Nobel Prize, and uh, died, you know, in a very comfortable place in old age, um, but struggled with the departure of the muse. And uh, thanks to um, the uh, vehicle press site, uh, what is believed potentially to be his last poem is posted, was posted there, and I thought it would be a fitting thing to read too. It is also the centenary, of course, of this poet's birth. The poet's invocation to his muse. My alter ego, my diabolical other self, where are you? A whole month goes by, yet not a single peep from you. Let me have it straight. Did you grow careless from too long service? Or was it the tremors of old age made you spiteful and prankish? You gone, invoking your attendance by scribbles are as pale as a water my scribbles are as pale as a watermark. No fire in them, no punch. Return. Make my brain boil again. Make it seethe with the blood of electrified hitmen and of gallant warriors dying in an odious cause. How many sheets must I blacken before you set a premonitory fire to make myself shudder with familiar joy? I'm serious. Not even Coleridge's famous ode on despondency cheers me, nor Shelley's moan, marvelous and eloquent, while the bay's waters around him sparkle and dance. What hope for that mortal so lost to gloom, even another's misery, fails to restore his self-esteem? With one's life vital lie with one's life vital lies or illusions. My case is desperate. Haul your ass over here, pronto. Abandoned, I'll sit here forever like a paralytic, like a just invented Frankenstein, waiting for that first charge to shock me back to life. Uh, so of course the poet is Irving Layton. And uh, I thought it would be appropriate to do the Schrodinger thing and not know whether the poet is alive or dead until the very last moment, until you, you open the box. I don't know if we have time to hear him read. I, there's, this, there's a Smithsonian, um, uh, there's some really beautiful images in this too. Just there's one of Leighton in a, in a graveyard that is just absolutely superb. 
but uh, I will point the microphone right here and hopefully we will be able to hear it. Just one moment. Yep. I am Irving Layton, reading some poems from the Improved Binoculars. It's not really going to work, is it? The Birth of Tragedy. And me happiest when I compose poems. Can anybody hear it? Is Love, it? power, not really, eh? the huzzah of okay. battle, anyway. are something, okay. are much. Never mind. Uh, I'll try to post it on Facebook or something like that so that it can be shared. But it's beautiful reading of a great poem that is a fusion of those two opposites. Uh, and, you know, doesn't allow you to really sort of label him as either, you know, the misogynist, the bombast. He's a really subtle mind and an incredibly brave poet that made a lot of what we do today possible.